Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to start our Symposium 8th of the 133rd International Virtual Medical Conference of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Keeping with the theme of the uh, annual, annual academic sessions of this year, our symposium would be on psychological issues during and after COVID. We have three eminent speakers that will be talking to you. Uh, each would be talking to you over 20 minutes. And uh, at the end of the sessions, we'll be taking up questions from the audience as well as the uh, uh, the um, other the members and other registrants uh, who are uh, connected via Zoom. So our first speaker is uh, Dr. Vajira Dharmavadana, who is the consultant psychiatrist from Teaching Hospital Ratnapura and managing editor, Journal of Ruhuna Clinical Society. He would be talking to us on livelihoods and mental health. Over to Dr. Vajra Dharmawadana. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chairperson. Uh, you see, the slides, are they going to come naturally or? They would come, yes. Uh, yes, now it's the okay. on. Uh, thank you, SLMA, MC, and Indica. Uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk uh, on this topic, disasters, livelihood, and mental health. Uh, disasters uh, are generally defined as uh, catastrophic, I mean, destructive events uh, that overwhelms our our uh, resources. I mean, they could be uh, individual, family, or community, and and then the health system as well. And uh, they could be uh, uh, sudden or they could be uh, uh, prolonged as well. Uh, for example, uh, uh, people, uh, when they consider disaster, they often the tsunami-like things comes into picture. But uh, uh, pandemics, uh, uh, famines, they, they are all, all uh, considered disasters that last for a longer period. Uh, if you look at the classification of disasters, the basic classification is what we call man-made and natural disasters. Pandemics are actually a type of uh, uh, natural disaster, but uh, for our discussion purposes, I have uh, separated pandemics from the other natural uh, disasters. Uh, pandemics are peculiar in the sense, I mean, they, they probably have the uh, maximum effect uh, from, from when we compare it from the other type of disasters. For example, they say, uh, Spanish flu killed uh, more people than the whole people who were killed during the First World War. Uh, they have a widespread effect. That is the probably the main thing that differentiates from a natural disaster. For example, tsunami or landslide will have a more local effect, but this has a prolonged and a, and a widespread effect. And so there is what we call uh, uh, national bereavement and nationwide and international fear. Uh, and and uh, uh, doubts about the systems, uh, social disruption, they are they are more prevalent, especially because of the precautions and then the mitigation actions that we take to uh, counter the uh, pandemic. Uh, I mean, traditionally, these uh, issues are discussed in uh, discipline what we call disaster psychiatry. But when we uh, try to you know, highlight the issues that are more relevant for the pandemic mental health, uh, we can see, I mean, as opposed to a kind of uh, tsunami-like scenario, here we have a, a, a time lapse between the, uh, 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 what we call the effect and the, 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 uh, the uh, psychosocial or the psychological problems to emerge. And there's this peculiar issue of quarantine and isolation which leads to loneliness, entrapment, and of course, the, the behavioral and emotional contagion, the people uh, uh, following, or, or, or uh, the behavior and the emotional responses of other people. Now, this is especially relevant with regard to the, what we see in, in media. And psychological burden on health workers, 
uh, institution for example can be nodes of transmission compared to others and uh, especially in relation to this corona virus uh, situation we now uh, increase the talk of neuropsychiatric manifestations of this virus strokes have been described and delirium and psycho logical testing have uh, revealed uh, among the among the survivors uh, there are attentional impairments especially in relation to sustained attention and we know we know viruses can have its effect on brain especially with regard to hiv uh, like infections at the same time uh, uh, disasters are seen as kind of acute on chronic uh, uh, health emergency because to start with we have never been in a, in a normal scenario if you take the psychiatric disorders i mean the population survey say 10% only 10% of the depressive disorder patients are treated in in any any type of uh, 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 healthcare setting so 90% are anyway untreated so on top of that we get these uh, uh, disasters coming in traditionally uh, uh, i mean it's best to see disaster and its mental health implications on a phasic manner this is the typical disaster cycle that they describe in the in the books this is from the textbook of disaster psychiatry uh, published by cambridge university press i mean here you can see okay there is a, what we call the pre disaster say, sorry uh, situation and with the immediate impact you see a dip and with the heroic efforts the initial efforts you can see a improvement in the situation but as the time goes on the the stagnation setting in disillusionment people getting frustrated and you can see again a dip and so this is the kind of typical uh, pattern you will see after a tsunami or, or landslide or major uh, uh, slingshot acute uh, disaster uh, probably more useful way is to look at psychosocial impact if we look at what you call the immediate social impact and then the intermediate and the later later social impact the immediate social impact is the thing that lead to syndromes like uh, ptsd acute stress reactions things like that but uh, the impact on livelihoods leads to more kind of delayed uh, 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 emergence of psychosocial problems uh, coinciding with the phase 2 here so we are probably now entering to the phase 2 uh, effects of the corona pandemic and now they they wait for second wave of uh, infection prob some people say actually second wave is going to be or already a, a mental health uh, 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 implication has emerged as a, a, a problem the psychological and behavioral consequences of these disasters actually emerge from interaction between several uh, uh, dimensions for example the, we have the disaster impact that is the destruction death related to disaster and the other factors are of course related to this more re- related to i mean corona uh, epi- uh, pandemic and especially in relation to uh, for example our country because we haven't seen uh, Uh, much deaths or, or cases compared to other countries we have consequences actually related to the response the can- country has uh, 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 um, uh, exercised and then the counter measures that we have initiated which are having a major impact on the on the uh, livelihoods of the people and of course individual factors also are there as a kind of background factor not all people are equally affected whatever the stressor may be uh, all these factors have a major impact on what we call the social determinants of mental health be it be uh, uh, your job your education uh, your uh, uh, other uh, psychosocial uh, uh, aspects they all could be affected by these uh, uh, measures that we initiate if you look at the the human responses you can broadly categorize them into okay distress these are kind of symptoms not amount into uh, what we call clinical syndromes it can be insomnia low mood not depression per se anxiety distress about future uncertainty things like that 
and of course they they can uh, uh, lead to disorders of newly emergers or worsening of previous disorders uh, there are disorders like for example uh, what we call reactive psychosis and of course the other other aspect is what we call the health risk behaviors like domestic violence substance use disorders uh, uh, those are behaviors that you see in the background of disorder disasters Uh, some people are more vulnerable for example socially deprived uh, that is probably the bottom line i mean some uh, uh, people are more affected than the others poor are more affected casual workers are more affected than permanent workers they estimate about 1.5 billion casual workers will be affected by the corona uh, pandemic globally and estimates for sri lanka is about about uh, maybe 10 lakhs uh, about 3 uh, Three lakhs of people have already lost jobs in the in the casual sector. Minorities are more affected, mentally ill are more affected, and physically ill after. Actually, some of the mentally ill are having a comorbid physical illness as well. So, already vulnerable people are more affected. So you you should not look for the no kind of emergence of these disorders. Already, uh, ill people are more affected. So, what are the mental health interventions that we have? Uh, for acute of course i mean these are valid for all uh, disorder disasters psychological first aid is the one that is recognized as kind of acute intervention uh, which is uh, a kind of uh, uh, counseling approach and it need not be medical person who, is, who will be providing this it involves you listening to the the individuals and communities affected and and helping them to find the best support available the approaches need to be actually public mental health rather than kind of hospital based uh, uh, institution based uh, mental health interventions fostering resilience decreasing and treating already established disorders and responding to health risk behaviors like substance use uh, domestic violence like like this i mean not all the effects are bad sometimes there are beneficial effects of uh, this sort of disasters as well for example fever uh, road traffic accidents more brains served dr gunaratn will appreciate that i suppose uh, uh, lesser uh, uh, outdoor pollution and people realize what matters most in life is probably not the things that we go after children i mean realize i mean you can eat better food at home rather than you know shit food delivered by this you know uber eats and people have uh, 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 resorted to more home gardening now which is a good thing and neighborhood uh, solidarity has probably gone up they say if you know if you can name the uh, or give the names of the the members uh, or the inhabitants in your street Uh, compared to a person who cannot name the uh, inhabitants your mental health is probably better that means you basically know you your neighborhood uh i mean during the corona time one of my uh, neighbors asked me is it true doctor that donald trump is dumping these people in the sea and uh, these bodies are eaten by the fish and these fish are coming to the paleo uh, fish market <laughs> probably spreading corona in this country Uh, and all the gentlemen I mean, that that uh, uh, explains the uh, lot of things uh, so much so for the health education <laughs> so okay now i i go into one uh, one uh, uh, this is going to be my last uh, subject area uh, the uh, industry has been uh, has received a boon due to this corona right Uh, people in Rattapura say Corona Hindi api godagi asa. It has be- because the because demand is high, demand is high. Partly because partly this flavour, you know, it's uh, supposed to be anti-viral. Anti-viral. There is some evidence for that as well. So people are now people more resorting to tea, 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 uh, tea cultivation, and people are some people are now uh, uh, repenting that they sold their tea blocks a uh, few few months back. I saw one person at least who is, uh, I mean, clinically depressed because he sold his uh, T estate uh, three months ago, <laughs> just prior to the Corona thing. 
and the person who bought the estate is now reaping <laughs> money <laughs> now this is uh, uh, what if we go into let the uh, cultivation spread is going to happen this is from rakwan area i mean this is i mean tea is found in in the wet mainly in the wet zone and in the hill country area where is and is uh, intruding most of the time into the natural habitats the rainforest habitat this is in rakwan i mean adjacent area is singaraj uh, this is a place where recently they found few few endemic uh, reptiles new uh, to the whole world and tea has a, a major impact on environment biodiversity loss agrochemical use siltation or reverse landslide risk i mean they can uh, feed on to more disasters uh this is a picture from uh, uh the recent landslide uh, that occurred i mean these, these are all disasters in moravaka i had a patient when i was working in mathara who was uh, whose house was located just adjacent to this this whole uh, kind of landslide he was uh, he was in uh, kamburu gamuwa long stay and he saw this uh, landslide uh, telecast over the television and he just disappeared from the boat his he was trying to reach his home but he couldn't because the flood was covering whole morocco area and he was found in in his sister's place in uh, uh gaul so we did a home visit and we found now if you can closely observe this picture i mean either side of the 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 mud stream you see i mean tall trees these are dipterocarpus trees from the rain forest this deeda rain forest uh the 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 starting front of the the landslide is from, uh, according to the i mean people in the area in a area where they uh, cut the uh, the huge trees and the rotting of the roots made water seep onto the bedrock and resulted in uh, mud slipping uh, over the bedrock and uh, if you go into the surrounding area you can basically see how uh, uh, unregulated tea cultivation is being done in the uh, uh, protected uh, areas so th- this is the area this is close to singaraj rain forest deedavais right at the bottom adjacent to the rain forest the rakwana hills are on the uh, northern uh, aspect and all the area is is uh, actually surrounded by by tea gardens so the the new normal i mean which is the the theme of the slma conference new normal cannot be kind of just uh helping people to uh, uh resort to whatever the profitable uh, ventures that they find and the demands uh, you probably need to uh, do it in more more uh, sustainable manner considering the biodiversity and the, and the already established and this this are having more you know macro uh, uh, impacts as far as you know themes like climate change uh, and they are considered so what can medical profession do i mean this uh, should we be kind of protesting against uh, deforestation for example uh there are some uh, for example uh, climate alliances formed by uh, medical professionals uh, campaigning for climate justice maybe uh, environmental justice uh, sustainable normality that's all on time thank you very much um, dr vajra darmadana uh, we would be taking up questions at the end of the uh, three speakers the presentations our next speaker is you know that the burnout of the medical professionals and healthcare workers was another uh, issue that was faced by um, i mean the health professionals 
globally. So we would be discussing on burnout among healthcare workers during the COVID-19 pandemic by Professor Wahu Yun Law. The Professor Waf Yun Law is a professor of psychology at the Faculty of Medicine, University Malaya, KL, Malaysia. Currently, she is the Deputy Executive Director at the Asia European Institute, University of Malaysia. She is the Managing Editor of the Asia Pacific Journal of Public Health and also the President of the Asia Pacific Academic Consortium for Public Health. Over to you, Professor Waf Yun Law. Right. Thank you so much. Okay, can you all see my slides? Yes, 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 yes. Right. Okay. Right, you can see my slides, right? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Let's start now. First of all, thank you so much for having me here at the uh, SLMA conference here. And thank you so much for the kind introduction, uh, Madam Chairman. So the topic I was given, it's actually burnout among healthcare workers uh, during the pandemic. Now, uh, I'm sure all of you are aware that the pandemic is currently one of the major global uh, health emergency. And uh, during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, healthcare workers face an enormous uh, amount of mental health uh, issues and uh, challenges. Right, okay. Uh, now, prior to the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it has actually been shown in numerous studies that many clinicians actually face burnout uh, or the other various uh, mental health uh, uh, issues such as stress, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and uh, suicide. And all these have actually put global and national healthcare system to test, uh, you know, when it is uh, overwhelmed or can compromise the well being of the healthcare uh, workers. And so, what is happening is there's greater, you know, uh, workplace hardship and also the moral dilemma that sometimes the, the physicians, the healthcare workers have to make. And all these exacerbate the current levels of the burnout and related uh, mental health uh, issues. Okay, now what exactly is burnout? As we know, uh, it is a syndrome specific to the workplace and typically occurs in otherwise psychologically healthy individuals. And some of the key uh, symptoms are, for instance, emotional exhaustion and reduced uh, interest uh, in, uh, with a diminished uh, feeling of personal uh, accomplishment. And in the, the, the famous uh, author, you know, Matt Lash, who actually came up with a uh, Matt Lash uh, burnout inventory, uh, she defined uh, burnout as an erosion of the, of the soul uh, caused by deterioration uh, you know, on the values, on the dignity, on the spirit, and on the willpower of an individual. Uh, and so uh, when uh, Dr. Christina McNett came up with this uh, McNett Burnout Inventory, uh, with this, uh, which is a very commonly used instrument to measure uh, burnout. And uh, he states that people who have uh, burnout and you know, begin to lose all concern, all emotional feeling for people uh, whom they work with and come to treat them in a very detached or even dehumanized way. And all these, you know, some of the symptoms, fatigue, depression, anxiety, and also PTSD, drugs, and alcohol uh, uh, dependency. And this has actually taken a toll on the healthcare uh, uh, workers in terms of taking time off. Uh, their performance is actually compromised. And in some cases as well, uh, they had no choice but to leave uh, work. Now, studies have actually shown that one in every three uh, physician is experiencing uh, burnout. Uh, burnout occurs when there's physical, emotional, uh, spiritual energy reserves are actually depleted and this causes exhaustion, you know, uh, in a person. And it is characterized by burnout, uh, cynicism and self-doubt. And, and this is what is known as depersonalization. And also the lack of uh, efficiency. That means it actually affects, you know, one's uh, productivity. Right, 
So the increased burnout, especially during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, is that you know, uh, some healthcare uh, workers, practitioners, have actually have to make a very difficult uh, patient decision. Yeah, they are forced to ration life-saving critical care and ventilator support in countries that they have very limited ventilators. So they have no choice but to make a decision as to who, who, who they should be taken care of and who they should be left alone. And there is also a fear for personal safety and inadequate preparation. And all this causes uh, a lot of uh, frustration. And also uh, paranoia. Paranoia you know, in some uh, healthcare uh, workers, for instance, they may be asymptomatic, but they kept thinking that they are you know, uh, COVID-19 positive or you know, paranoia in the sense that am I carrying home uh, the infection to my kids, to my wife, to my husband and the whole family? Or you know, is there increasing mortality risk uh, to my loved one? So these are some of you know, situations where the burnout could actually increase among the uh, healthcare uh, workers. And what are consequences of burnout? Uh, it lowers patient satisfaction and also lower the care, the quality of care pr uh, provided to the uh, patients. Uh, high medical error rates, uh, we make mistakes and malpractices rises. Uh, high uh, physician and staff turnover and also some of them turn to alcohol and other substance abuse. And also uh, there's a cause for concern for physician uh, suicide as well. Now, let me just uh, bring up a couple of studies. I think uh, due to the COVID pandemic, there has been an uh, enormous amount of uh, uh, literature. And this is actually one of them. You know, uh, This study was actually done uh, among the frontliners, particularly the nurses, in two hospitals in uh, Wuhan, China. And uh, the uh, response rate is actually 214. Now, here you can see they use the uh, uh, MacLab burnout inventory. And uh, what you can see that, you know, the nurses here actually reported uh, a very high, uh, high and moderate, you can see here a high and moderate uh, emotional exhaustion. Yeah, emotional exhaustion. And it accounts for about, uh, you can see here it accounts for about uh, 60%. Uh, following it's the depersonalization under the uh, MacLeod burnout uh, inventory. And so here you can see the high and uh, moderate dependency. Uh, it's about 42% uh, here. Yeah. And finally, personal accomplishment. Uh, personal accomplishment, you can see the high and moderate accomplishment. That will be about 60% uh, here. And so forth and so on, they also measure anxiety. They also measure depression, fear, and skin lesion. And here you can see that, you know, as far as uh, moderate and severe depression is concerned, yeah, uh, mild, moderate, and severe uh, depression is about 14% here. And depression, moderate, uh, it's about 11% here, and severe depression. And there is also this fear, yeah, a lot of healthcare providers uh, actually have this incident of uh, fear. And you can see moderate, it's about uh, moderate and severe, it's about 91% of those uh, frontline nurses, uh, you know, are experiencing fear. And what about skin lesion as well? Uh, skin lesion is because of all the PPE that they are wearing. And this, in fact, you know, has uh, a lot of them, you know, has 94% of them, if you can see, you know, uh, those more than one to four skin lesion or five to eight or 10, you know, in total, it's about 94% of them have experienced some form of uh, skin uh, lesion. So from their study, you know, in Wuhan, these two main hospitals, uh, uh, the mental health outcomes are actually positively correlated with skin lesion, yeah, uh, positive correlated with skin lesion and also uh, negative correlated with self-efficacy, uh, resilience, social support, and uh, the frontline willingness to work. This means that when a nurse have better you know, self-reliance, better social support or more social support, uh, they experience less mental health uh, 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 problems. And so here, frontliners suffer fear of inf uh, infection and death, you know, as well as, you know, uh, fearing for their loved ones 
uh, as well. And so what uh, came out from their study is the future intervention uh, at the national and organization levels are needed to improve the mental health uh, of all these frontliners during the pandemic in terms of preventing and managing the skin disease, uh, leisure, building more self-efficacy and resilience, and providing more social support and frontliners uh, willingness to work. Uh, following this, it's uh, in Europe, a study, as you are very well aware, uh, Italy is grappling, you know, uh, with the worst pandemic in Europe. And this is a study, uh, you know, um, by the Italians, uh, looking at, again, the healthcare uh, workers, a uh, total of 1,153. And you can see here that, you know, as far as uh, the emotional exhaustion under the Medbag burnout inventory, and about one in three of them, yeah, have high scores uh, on emotional exhaustion. And as far as uh, depersonalization is concerned, one out of four of them reported high levels uh, of, uh, personal de of, of uh, depersonalization and personal gratification as well. They have very low levels of uh, personal uh, uh, gratification. Right. And these are some of the, uh, you can see, you know, perceived uh, impact uh, of, uh, um, on psychology and their physical health. Uh, I won't go through each and every one. You can see all the percentages here, experience symptoms in the last month, increased irritability, change in food habit, uh, difficult falling asleep, muscle tension, exaggerated reactions to situations, uh, nightmare, uh, nervous breakdown, increased uh, sweating, uh, upset of stomach, uh, gastrointestinal problems, and so forth and uh, so on. Now, uh, from their study as well, you can also see the effect of gender on emotional exhaustion. Uh, you know, there are higher levels of uh, uh, emotional exhaustion among the males, among the females as compared to the males. Probably it's because if you look at the social demographic data of all these participants of the 1153 participants, about 73% of them are actually female uh, uh, healthcare uh, providers compared to the male. And uh, here again, you know, gender and occupational role, comparing the uh, nurses and the physicians as well. Uh, physicians, you know, uh, you know, encounter less of it as compared to um, nurses. And so this is, uh, you know, uh, I'm just thinking the burnout. You can see, you know, this is the burnout, you know, lack of job control, excessive workload, prolonged work stress. And these are all the symptoms encounter. And subsequently, how does it affect decreased productivity, decreased quality of patient care, patient satisfaction, increase in turnover, increase in medical errors, substance abuse, and so forth and so on. And these are some of the interventions that one could actually uh, uh, take in order to address, you know, uh, uh, the burn burnout in healthcare uh, providers. And so sources of physician stress and anxiety, uh, access to appropriate PPEs, uh, as you're well aware in some countries, you know, uh, they have a lack of this. And so I think there should be more of this to be provided so as to decrease or, or decrease the anxiety. And exposure of COVID at work and bringing an infection home to family, lack of access, to testing if the physician developed COVID-19, the symptoms and the fear. And also the anxiety and the uncertainty that physician organization will support and take care of the physicians personally should they become infected. And also uh, access to childcare during increased work hours and school as well. Uh, uh, con continue from there, the lack of support for other personal and family needs should the work demands increase and being able to provide competent medical care if they are deployed to a new area. I think there has been a shift in terms of uh, uh, the healthcare being sent you know, to all the hospitals that are dedicated to COVID. Uh, other you know, physicians or other even surgeons you know, are told to come upon uh, to, to address the COVID, uh, to help with the COVID uh, cases. And the lack of access to up-to-date information and communication uh, there has been also a lot of fake news around and misinformation, uh, and therefore this also increased uh, the fear among the uh, healthcare providers. And what are the strategies in supporting clinicians during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic? 
uh, of course, we do need to value, you know, uh, uh, clinicians themselves, uh, the healthcare providers, not just clinicians, but also uh, the nurses and other health, health, uh, allied healthcare providers. Uh, communicate the best practices in terms of managing expectation, uh, in terms of promoting resilience, ensure appropriate work hours with breaks, uh, proper shift, emphasize the importance of self-care and also food and hygiene and monitor and promote clinician well-being, personal safety, and the safety of the family as well. And to provide a very supporting and uh, brain-free uh, work culture as well, uh, to provide an appropriate psychological and safe environment, uh, to be able to discuss uh, vulnerability, their stress, their burnout, and other barriers that's related uh, to their well-being. And uh, of course, you know what we have as well to enable collaboration and cooperation even uh, between the different disciplines, uh, between you know uh, different hospitals, and of course uh, you know from the local district to national and international accessibility as well uh, for support and central you know access point for updated information, technical updates and tools to address a COVID nineteen, and also to ensure that clinicians are not required to return to work should the dire situations sometimes might arise, uh, you know, this is where shifts uh, are, are important and not, you know, uh, overburdening uh, the clinicians. Uh, provide appropriate resources should the clinicians are affected with COVID, yeah, the right compensation, rehabilitation, curative services, and to be able to meet their, their, their very, very basic needs as well. Uh, you know, able to take breaks, uh, to be able to stay connected uh, especially with their loved ones, their family, the colleagues, to avoid isolation because it's 24-7 uh, that they're actually in the ward, you know, in the hospital, dealing with patients. Uh, to be able to respect uh, differences because we're all, you know, uh, physicians coming from different disciplines and all of us have uh, different skills. Uh, stay updated, online meetings, perform uh, self checkup, and, uh, you know, do honour, you know, the services as well. And strategies to address uh, burnout among healthcare providers. Uh, we also need to make them be aware of their potential uh, burnout. Uh, they never know, you know. Uh, sometimes they themselves, you know, uh, you know, uh, falling into this uh, burnout uh, issue. Uh, promoting positive mental health mindfulness, as well as our, our previous speakers mentioned, and also the self care uh, practices. And of course, to ensure mental health services are being provided, you know, at all levels of the healthcare uh, uh, providers. And of course, uh, in this day and age, uh, you know, with IR4, uh, we do need to leverage on digital technology to 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 prevent mental health issues. Uh, in, and I say it again, you know, with uh, digital world, with the IR4 uh, industrial revolution. So, and because of the lockdown and what have you, so sometimes, you know, we do need to tap on all these uh, digital devices uh, in terms of contract uh, tracing and what have you. And also to create an enabling en environment through organizational approach. So the organizational uh, restructuring, it's also important. Uh, so to, to give an enabling environment to the uh, healthcare providers uh, in terms of addressing uh, their needs. And in conclusion, uh, we do know that, you know, uh, healthcare workers are going to work during this pandemic. Uh, they, they, they are, you know, experiencing immense uh, pressure, putting uh, their physical, mental and social well-being at risk. And they expose all this excessive stress, you know, causing them to have burnout. And subsequently what happened is, you know, quality and safety healthcare to the patients are actually compromised and unhealthy behavior, absence from work, uh, reduced productivity and risk of suicide as well among healthcare providers. And therefore, you know, the multidimensional and different levels of intervention are actually needed to provide uh, different strategies to support our healthcare uh, uh, providers. Uh, with that, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lo. Just let us show our appreciation in the usual manner. The uh, new normal was a new way of life for all of us. Just like there were advantages of new normal for being together in families, there were disadvantages. 
they have a complex in families. So let us now move on to our next, next speaker, the, na the Dr. Professor Priyanjali de Soisa, who will be talking to us on the nature of and coping with family conflict during a lockdown. Professor Priyanjali de Soisa is a professor of the Faculty of Medicine and is a clinical psychologist by profession. She co-founded an MPhil in clinical psychology degree at the University of Colombo, which is the first training program in professional clinical psychology. Uh, she was the founder president of the Sri Lanka Psychological Association, and she has held several key positions in national level organizations, including the National Child Protection Authority, National Steering Committee on Child Rights, and the National Mental Health Advisory Council. Over to you, Priyanjali. Thank you, Dr. All right. So um, I'm going to talk about the impact the pandemic had on the family. Most of my talk would be on the negative impact, but there's always a positive in any scenario. So I'll be talking a little bit about the positive as well. Um, so we know that the family is a collection of individuals. And, but the family itself is more than the collection of individuals. As Aristotle said, the whole is more than its parts. And um, we know that any traumatic event, including a war or a pandemic or any minor event, impacts the family because all the members or some of the members have been impacted. Uh, sometimes it can impact the family for better. The family can function better because of a traumatic event, but sometimes it can be worse. Why it becomes worse is not really because of the traumatic event, such as the pandemic, but it's actually pre-existing, pre-pandemic functioning of the family has just been really highlighted. So, for example, if the communication patterns within the family members had been anywhere rather negative and dysfunctional, or there had been hardly much mutual respect between the family members pre-pandemic, when a humongous strain comes into the system, this becomes hugely highlighted, which leads to problems. So it's not just the pandemic itself. It is existing issues that have become highlighted. So we know that, for example, so I'm going to talk about uh, three or four different aspects of family functioning that has negatively impacted because of the pandemic, COVID. First is uh, breakups, separations, and divorce. Uh, data, particularly initially coming from China, but as well as other parts of the world, have shown that separation, divorce, and family breakups has increased post-pandemic or during the pandemic. So there's data for that. Uh, the reason is that you know, during the lockdown areas, the, the family was always together. And that we, and that's unusual because usually we have our own life. We go to work, children go to school, they go for tuition. We meet each other only in the evening. But always being with these family members that you actually don't know much about, you know, you know only a little bit, can be quite a high-pressure situation. And this constant family contact could lead to exacerbating negative impact, negative features of the family. Further, no outside contact. So we, we don't have much contact with our friends. Uh, we may be having colleague relationship. We may be having doing our sports. Now, all of that has suddenly been removed as well. And you're stuck with these four or five people that you don't really know much about. Then there will be financial strain. So if you don't have lots of money, or if you have been daily work wage earners or on a very tight budget, financial strain could have added to it. And particularly for women, uh, we talk about domestic violence in the next slide, we know that women have unpaid labor in a family is mostly held by women. So caring for children, elderly parents, cooking, cleaning is particularly in traditional societies like Sri Lanka is more held by women. So what happens is this entire like a pressure cooker situation can really give rise to marital separation relationship breakdowns and divorce. So it's again, I'm saying it's actually pre-COVID issues have been highlighted. It's not because the, of the COVID itself. Now we know that divorce, separation and marital breakup is difficult in normal times, but it becomes worse psychologically for the person concerned during a pandemic. Because we know that even a person is going through a relationship breakup or a separation or a divorce, having social support 
makes your mind feel better. But when in a pandemic, we may be able to talk to a person on the phone, but because you can't sit with a friend and talk, it can be very, very difficult mentally. Then people go out, do retail therapy, shopping, have a lunch with a friend. That also helps us soothe our mind, which we don't have in time of a pandemic. So you're stuck inside the home with a spouse that you do not like, suddenly so realize you want to leave this person, but you can't go out. So it can be very, very mentally challenging. Then pursuing new relationships is a no-no because you don't have opportunity to new, meet new people. So it can be quite psychologically impactful for the person concerned and for the family itself when these things happen. A second dimension of family um, conflict is violence against women. Now, usually when we call for violence against women, we think of bruises and stuff, physical violence, but we're also talking about psychological violence here, sexual violence, and financial violence, which you don't really talk much about openly. You only talk about physical usually. We have uh, referred to violence against women as the shadow pandemic, that's, that's a technical term, because we know that the pandemic is there, but behind it is another pandemic where usually men are violent towards women. There is the other way also, but it's not common. We have seen in India, uh, uh, reports have said that there has been a 120% increase in hotline calls. Uh, complaining about domestic violence. Sri Lanka too, but I don't have the proper uh, proper statistics, but uh, NGOs that work in um, domestic violence have said they've got really big uh, hotline calls, their shelters are full, women have been battered, so there's a huge problem. Now, what I just want to talk about a project that we did with our university students from Faculty of Medicine. We have a little club called the Golden Sea Club, which is a daughter club of Zonta Club One. Uh, I'm the academic advisor. So we actually want to do something on violence against women during this pandemic time. It was a 1.5 month long project. It was a social media project primarily. So we used Facebook to, to give information about violence against women, but we also use WhatsApp groups of public, all Sri Lanka's public and hospital nurses. We use the sites of UNFPA websites and their WhatsApp groups FPA and MAS, the corporate sector, where we design, my students design two activities per week. One was a clip, an audiovisual clip on an aspect of violence against women, and one was a post. And the aspects that we pushed forward into the grassroots levels of our community was on things like indicators of violence. How would you identify a woman who is experiencing violence, physical and psychological signs? What could a woman do if they're experiencing violence? You know, how can you get help? What could a bystander do? Now, Because bystanders are really powerful. If you know somebody next door has been hit, what could you do during a pandemic to get information and help for that woman? What kind of legal action could a woman uh, have? And finally, we, very importantly, we talked about toxic masculinities. Toxic masculinity is where stereotyped ideas that traditional societies have about what a man should be. So for example, we did a research many years ago amongst medical students uh, in uh, certain faculties in our country, and it showed that certain medical students even say that if a woman refuses to have sex with her husband, it's okay to hit her. This is the data that came out. So those are toxic masculine ideas that certain traditional societies have, and we need to break them if you are going to reduce violence against women. So these kinds of information we fed into the community through these various networks to reduce violence against women. So that's one of the things that we could do. A third dimension about the pandemic and families is that violence against children have increased too. Uh, there's an increase in physical violence, psychological violence, and sexual violence. And there's an increase in exposure to domestic violence. But it's underreported. In fact, the reason is most cases of violence against children is reported by school teachers, and schools are closed. So we don't have a way of identifying it to the authorities. In fact, in the USA, rates have come down by 65% of violence against children, reporting rates. But that doesn't mean it's reduced. It's actually increased, but reportings are not coming in. So this is another area. Now, strategies to mitigate family conflict and its impact, what could we do in the time of a pandemic? 
the good thing is that many countries have looked into the arena of mental health which is a really good thing there's a lot of work being done in many countries on mental health strategies in the area of family the work is more on violence against women than violence against children however real hardcore in depth work is not possible because of physical distancing because in the mental health arena we need to connect to a person though of course there is tele health opportunities but many people don't have access to those things you know especially in the grassroots levels in monaragal or kabitigol level how could we actually access these women and children to offer mental health services so social media is an option but would these women actually be on a social media platform you see would they be on facebook learning about these things helping themselves so that's why when we use mas the corporate sector we contact their human resource managers in their factories who had a connection to all their factory girls and boys whether it's mintale or kabitigolla or munuragala and through those whatsapp networks we sent out our messages on how to protect themselves but then again can violence be truly prevented by only these kind of social media campaigns so that's the problem however what could we do in these limitations is that strengthening social support networks to protect women who are experiencing violence and protect children who are experiencing violence is important and of course economic empowering because we know that financial strain is a huge impact on violence that the government has to do not that we could do much about it finally the positives of the pandemic on the family uh, a study in china has said that 60% have remote reported that they have become more concerned about their family members So it seems that though we have breakdown separations divorce violence against women violence against elders are also having highly reported there's still people families that have got closer together um and they have said that they have understood what's truly important in life uh, they have reevaluated their life to see that just you know just going behind prestige positions material gain like fancy cars and fancy houses is really not the big picture of life people have expressed that they have changed their perspective in life how long they will have this changed perspective we do not know but it's there people have also stated that they have reevaluated their perception about themselves you know really know who they are so people who have realized i have anger problems of anxiety problems i'm not really the best person i thought i was they had time to think about themselves and maybe help themselves to become better versions of themselves in fact there has been an increase in online marriage applications in china uh, a significant increase there so I, don't, i don't have the value here to put so though there has been breakdowns and divorces and all that there's also been an increase in uh, marriage applications so they have been together as as well so in in conclusion there has been a great impact on the family but also certain positives thank you very much thank you very much professor priyanjali uh, for making that short but sort of very informative presentation on coping with family conflicts uh so uh now is the time for us to questions uh i would uh, open the symposium for questions uh if i could uh, start uh questions i do not know whether professor wo is online could the crew let me know whether professor wo is online hello yes yes uh so uh, uh if, if any of you all are with questions this is the time for questions i would like to ask professor wu the burnout is not uh, anything common to healthcare professionals i think that it is there with any of the uh, employees of any stressful situations is any uh, immediate uh, benefits or uh, remunerations uh, would make a difference to the degree of burnout Yeah, thank you so much for the question. Uh right. Um I I think you have said it correctly that uh you know uh during ordinary days as well not even uh with the pandemic or prior to the pandemic as well it's a very common feature among uh, healthcare providers 
and not just uh, among the physicians, but also among the, uh, uh, the nurses. So I think what is more important uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic is that I think uh, we have to reach out to all these uh, people who are having some uh, mental health issues, uh, anxiety, depression, stress, and what have you, uh, quickly before they actually, you know, come to the point of a burnout. You know, that might also lead to post-traumatic uh, 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 stress uh, uh, later on. So I think any form of uh, ruminations uh, would be good to help the nurses, uh, to help the uh, allied health professionals, and also uh, the physicians or the clinicians uh, in uh, uh, ammonorating the uh, symptoms that they may, have, they may be having. But it's also very important for them to, uh, for us actually to give them a safe environment where they could actually voice out uh, their mental health concern. Uh, because as you are aware, you know, sometimes, you know, people don't come out, you know, uh, to seek help. So I think among themselves as well, uh, there need to be some form of a social support in order for us to really uh, uh, help them, to allow them to voice out, you know, their concern. So I think uh, it is important for us to reach out to them, uh, not just, you know, uh, uh, waiting for them to come in. Uh, so any form of uh, reaching out, you know, uh, whether it's through the digital mode, the social media mode, uh, you know, um, the hospital, the organization coming out with some kind of a leaflet, you know, uh, trying to get them um, uh, to seek help as well. So yes, uh, any form of remunerations would certainly be good to, um, to leverage and to leverage on these uh, digital uh, devices as well to help them cope uh, with any form of mental uh, stress during this uh, pandemic. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bo. Uh, basically, I mean, what we need to understand is any sort of a reward uh, for the profession uh, would be a relief for them, isn't it? Uh, so any other questions, any other questions uh, uh, that yes, Manoj? That yes, Manoj. Yeah. I'm also reacting to this question uh, looking at the healthcare burnout because particularly from foreign media that we are seeing people are crying and uploading their grievances into the uh, social media and so on. My question here is that have you seen any preparedness or planning prior to something like this? For example, when it came in China, we knew sooner or later it will reach other countries because it is from the very beginning was a pandemic proportion so do you have, have or recollect any where where the health system prepared people before the exposure to deal with and not going into burnout situations uh, that's a very pertinent question you have asked uh, I, I think we are all very well aware that, you know, of course, you know, the pandemic actually started in China. So everyone is sort of, you know, trying uh, uh, to get ready, uh, you know, uh, because we have seen what is happening in China. And therefore, every country, you know, uh, uh, you know, have take actions uh, to provide this kind of support. Uh, one of the examples that I can, you know, cite, it's particularly, you know, pertaining from my own country itself. And uh, I must say that our Ministry of Health, you know, to get to, it's especially our Ministry of Health together with other uh, uh, ministry as well. Uh, we do prepare in, 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 in that sense as well. Uh, we, we have, you know, pool of, you know, uh, counselors, uh, psychologists, uh, uh, you know, uh, psychiatrists all coming into play to prepare, you know, the, the system uh, for such a four hour. And so uh, countries that are, uh, um, ready for it because we know exactly it's coming over, you know, to our country and therefore, you know, we need to sort of kind of uh, back up in terms of uh, addressing some of this mental issue. So, yeah, and, and I believe other countries, you know, who, who have the resources, you know, uh, uh, are actually uh, uh, do, doing this. But again, having said that, sometimes uh, we are very much limited by our human resources, uh, especially in the hospitals where sometimes, uh, you know, other, other discipline, other spe uh, specialists are actually called upon, you know, uh, uh, to, to work uh, in the field of COVID. And therefore, I think they will be more stressed out as compared to people who are used to treating infectious diseases. So again, you know, uh, who are we treating, how we are treating, 
uh, it, it depends all very much on uh, the, the, the resource capability in terms of uh, providing, you know, the mental health services, in terms of providing the proper infrastructure, in terms of providing other resources as well. So uh, again, it varies between country to country. Thank you. The uh, continue yeah. with the same topic. The now uh, uh, I remember. I mean, this burnout is a new concept. But the, now, when we were the junior doctors, I mean, there were plenty of instances we felt burnout, but we sort of continued and we thought that we cope up. Uh, so, is there? I mean, uh, I generally feel that the people in developing countries are more resilient than if otherwise. So, is there a difference between? The, uh, whether it's developed or developing country or poorly developed country with regard to burnout? Yeah, uh, right. Uh, comparing advanced country and other developing countries, I think you're absolutely right in terms of the concept of uh, resilience. Uh, so from the literature, when I was uh, you know, preparing all these things, uh, uh, studies have actually shown that uh, you, you know uh, people who are more uh, resilient. So and therefore, uh, should there be any intervention, you know, we need to you know sort of beef up, you know, one's resilient because uh, uh, the, the the better resilient it's a worker, the healthcare provider, uh, the lesser mental health, you know, they would have. Uh, but I think in terms of uh, developing and non-developing countries. Uh, uh, and, and I think we are much more uh, because of the workload that we are having, not to say that in the developed countries, they don't have that amount of workload. But I think we are more persevered, you know, to the kind of workload uh, that we are having, mainly in the developing countries. And I think we are more geared up, you know, uh, towards uh, dealing with all this uh, 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 heavy workload that we have. And so, yes, I think uh, people who are more resilient uh, would have a better chance of dealing uh, with the mental health issues. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wu, for that very worthy contribution to this discussion on the psychological issues on uh, during and after the COVID. Uh, if there are any other questions from the audience, yes, Sudhi Angani. I would like to ask uh, either Vajira or uh, Priyanjali, uh, during this period of uh, lockdown at home, how it really affected the school children, adolescents, uh, in their self-studying and online teaching as well as uh, use of these smart devices and social media on top of that. And uh, not interacting uh, physically with their friends, but throughout the day interacting with their groups and their colleagues uh, via social media. have the experience of shall I go there? Or? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you for raising that important question. We all uh, experience these things uh, at, at our homes. Uh, what they have uh, suggested from the uh, uh, research is uh, this uh, interaction with the with the uh, online media uh, can really have a, 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 a negative effect on subsequent face-to-face uh, -face, uh, communication uh, which they are, they are supposed to have. And they, they now talk about this concept called Zoom fatigue. I personally find it very difficult to uh, give lectures via Zoom without seeing, seeing the uh, audience themselves, how they respond and things like that. Because we are we are uh, technically kind of social uh, beings, and uh, uh, it's difficult for this uh, technical uh, interface to uh, uh, imitate the real situation. Uh, uh, at the same time, the the other other problem children are facing is their uh, physical exercise has been uh, curtailed for no apparent reason. I mean, I mean, my, my personal opinion is I mean, schools uh, have been closed for no scientific reasons. Uh, I mean, this uh, is a personal uh, view. I mean, they, they now they question why preschools are uh, opening first because preschool children are probably the least affected in the in the pandemic. Uh, uh, so it need to be, uh, and there can be there can be. Uh, 
for example cyber bullying uh, and other uh, um, uh, normal accidents that they talk of uh, related to uh, and at the same time the is is uh, some uh, uh, sociologists have raised the issue of social inequalities uh, hampering some children uh, receiving the same level of education because they may not be having access to to so we, it will actually feed on to the social uh, determinants that's that's my my kind of so if we move a little bit further because still we are within the subject that before uh, sorry during and after covid so for our academic programs now yeah. i think that previously we had to move for uh, uh, we had to be traveling to uh, for our all continuous medical education programs to be conducted in all uh, remote places yeah. but now Uh, i mean this is the sort of ideal setting for us for peripheral education so the uh, what is the psych psychiatrist uh, or psychologist opinion with regard to continuing with the uh, electronic system for distance education i'm um, distance education done episodically i suppose is is uh, useful i mean i when i did a uh, uh, presentation for the part 1 students i just asked them to uh, uh give their views via you know chat option uh, com- compared to you know you traveling and uh, receiving the lectures how do you uh, compare this sort of education and they all said now this is fantastic i i, I can uh, listen to all the lectures at home uh so certainly there are advantages but uh, uh i suppose uh, education is uh, not merely kind of a person interacting online is education is uh, much more that for for example uh, um, of course there are methods that they have uh, designed uh, 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 using uh, group activities in online platforms as well but uh, uh, but uh, real uh, interpersonal interaction and uh, uh even for for distant education uh, sessions some of the uh, i suppose uh, education uh, occurs uh, outside the real uh, uh, venue i suppose afternoon chats uh, where you meet with other people and you can have uh, clarifications I and mean, those options probably are uh, not available when you when you stick to the <laughs> macha mukaddama ki we are coming there on so that sort of things you will not be able to uh, thanks so, sir uh, yes 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 for major us we know that post traumatic stress syndrome is developed particularly with the war or after tsunami we had certain things but uh, what is the uh, current uh, understanding about covid prolonged covid giving rise to something like that yeah ptsd i i suppose is not as prevalent as i mean say after a major uh, war uh, encounter or let's say tsunami we don't i mean in in this country of course we do not see even people are dying uh, in new york for be okay you will hear next door person dying of uh, no i mean we are we are lucky in that sense uh, in general is it possible even in If you look at New York City or what you are looking at Bolivia at the moment, people can get PTSD after seeing a, a major a kind of uh, what we call uh, death scenarios. Uh, but but uh, I think the figures clearly show the PTSD is not as common as let's say uh, during a, a, a protracted war or. Uh, uh, major landslide you it's, know it's it's not ptsd i think in my experience i think that there is so much of this depression because of the yeah. economical uh, yeah. impact on the uh, people the community is this where the social determinants that and is 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 occurs with the with the with the lack of face like and even in the in the uh, uh war and other disaster scenarios Uh, i think we have probably little bit uh, overvalued the diagnosis of or uh, given over emphasis to ptsd because of you know the literature is coming from us and uh, you know this veteran administration related uh, veterans uh, 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 interest uh, dominant in in that country 
because some studies clearly say depression is more prevalent than PTSD and then those two tend to go together as well. So, so. Yeah. Thank you, Vajra. Yeah. Thank you. My question is from uh, Priyanjali. Uh, the, uh, with regard to the home conflicts and violence, uh, I don't think that we mention much on alcohol, the influence of alcohol uh, on the family conflicts. I don't know what, uh, whether you would like to sort of elaborate a little bit more because that would be important, I feel. Definitely alcohol would have played a big role in this family conflicts, don't you think so? Uh, sorry, it's your same question. Yes, ma'am. But I would phrase it this way because most of the time when you have these studies, they talk about cigarette smoking and all that. Nobody yes. speaks about alcohol. Yes. Now, alcohol, there was a time when the people you saw I mean, pictorially we saw it when the taverns were open, how the men rushed out without <laughs> any concern. And yes. we, we are in a state to that, with, without alcohol and being with the family, mm. has the, uh, whatever you are measuring, become worse or less. First on the wife and then the children. Children. Yes. If you have any, you see, yeah. Yes. Yes. But because we don't have an acute thing to give the disease one. Yes. Is this also a thing about about alcohol or any you know, this kind of substances does have an impact, but really it's to do with already dysfunctional family functioning. So we couldn't you can't just say that because a man takes alcohol, therefore he goes and hits the wife or the child. But it's all it's more deep problems within the family functioning of no mutual respect, no communication issues, which then people can blame it on the alcohol. You know, but really it's that people haven't really learned ways of communicating with others or being respectful of others. It's because of that lack. But then alcohol could be added on top as the icing on the cake. And we tend to then blame the alcohol. No, but the uh, uh, I'm not saying about what you have studied now, but our situation, Local is an excellent study field mm. to bring out these facts. You know, mm. I'm not saying we don't have alcohol mm. because even the WHO we have shown that alcohol is bad. Mm. They say even the <laughs> general president says drink less or something. Mm. That rubbish. You know, alcohol is bad. No? Mm. So that what I'm saying is we have a thing to see yeah. the, the, People were as they used to drink and come home. We know that, no? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They don't have dogs. They yeah, my uh, feeling is that for the parents, I mean, the, for the same question, yeah. the um, yeah. the person would not have reacted unless he was under the influence of alcohol. Mm -hmm. It's the same same conflict, mm -hmm. but say if he's under the influence. He would behave differently too if he was not under the influence of alcohol. Certainly, so, inhibitions are reduced. Yes. Yeah, that, that's what you're saying. Yes. Yes. yes exactly. Yes. yes. There was a period when it was not available. No, I mean, I don't know. It's when the yes. for smoking, I think there is data that the quitting yes. of smoking. There are is data that about ten percent or whatever people have quit smoking. Mm, right. But yeah. uh, still, we have not seen alcohol. anything on alcohol. alcohol. No. Right, right. Quitting, right. Yeah. right. Because there is the informal industry of alcohol that was functioning. Yes. The casino right. and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but this is a good situation where people were not access to alcohol and their yes. behavior. Yes. I mean, we can do that and keep We imagine, them. madam, that the people had no access. Again, we do not have data to say that whether we, they did not really did not have access or not. We do not know because the, even at the village level, they had this locally uh, brewed varieties. Uh, so, and even uh, here in cities, least, it was... you can at least compare the households that didn't have alcohol and people yes, who had yes. alcohol. Right. Like that. Because we have studies on alcohol. Right. Yeah, can I? Yeah. Ah, 10 minutes more. Right. Ah? Sorry? Yeah. yeah, yes, yes, yes. Shall so, so I ask one more question regarding anime again, adolescent? Uh, the adolescent, what is the impact of this social media 
uh, because the children did uh, get uh, access to social media without any restrictions because they are online they are on online they have to have online teaching so no restrictions parents doesn't know but while online teaching they are chatting each other so um, but there are some children actually they use this online platform to learn some more things for example uh, so music and all they themselves got improved uh, some of their talents actually but at the same time what tech exactly uh, the impact on this uh, social media uh, during this period yeah. the general social media before the pandemic but the general what we have seen is that uh, the platforms like Facebook is useful for certain aspects. For example, to get information from somebody, to get resources. In Sri Lankan context, the research that we have seen, we have conducted, what it showed was that most of us, we have lost contact with our school, school friends, unlike in other countries where they keep in touch. So when Facebook was introduced to Sri Lanka, a lot of people got in touch with their school friends again via that portal, which led to actual physical meetups, which led to increased psychological and life satisfaction well-being. So that is there. So that's a general research. Coming to pandemic-related social media, again, getting information is a benefit point. So for example, if I'm a grade 10 student, I can connect with my friend and get information. But if a person is simply surfing the net or Instagram or Facebook, that itself leads to decline mental health. Because why? There is a comparison. Because actually it's quite false what we put on Facebook. We put a life that is actually not there maybe. But a person viewing it thinks that's her life, that's his life. And you start comparing which leads to dips in your mental health. Uh, so while I was preparing for my talk today, I was looking at some international data on the impact on young children and social media use, because that's what they've been using for schoolwork. And that has said there have been serious consequences for their mental health. That is because too much of time, you know, doing it for unnecessary reasons, etc. Yeah. So that's not that it's all bad, it is good, but if it goes out of control, it can have an impact. What we put in uh, Facebook is actually not the real life and a bit of a different uh, this thing. And this uh, cooking and all these new... Uh, <laughs> uh, gardening. Yeah, gardening and all those things they put in the social media. And the people actually who don't have access to get sometimes uh, butter and all in lockdown area, they were really depressed. I mean, personally, I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I totally agree because, yeah. Uh, so. Uh, In fact, there were jokes not also. Only, yeah, it. not only children. Not only children. Uh, In fact, there was a joke that said that everybody has to bake at least one cake for the pandemic to finish. <laughs> everybody was ba so it was it was it was very distressing for some yeah. people. Told them what the discussion came up. Certain conditions as nomophobia, no mo mobile phobia, and internet addiction. Put it be a scenario post COVID for the psychiatrist and psychologist to yeah. actually intervene. You mean to say people would have got too involved in yes. those, uh, those mm -hmm. things? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, mean, we, I suppose we need to know whether people now can't retract from it. But uh, actually, some, uh, just ad hoc reports, Krishanta, is that people have said that once we open up after that few weeks of lockdown, uh, pe who are medical colleagues of mine, they were saying that they were very sociable for pre-pandemic, but they felt very uncomfortable to go out and again interact because they had got so used to a non-responsive audience and they were really worried. So there, those kind of reports are coming. Which can then lead to mental health consequences at a, you know, at a, even the criteria can be met as well. So yes, yeah, so we might need to look into that. So I think that can I compare one thing that with that uh, the professor from outside? Yes, ma'am. In a graph that I know, that's yes. right. Which, uh, which uh, the, the three days, three days, seven days, seven days, seven days and, and one year. One year. 
here. It's the same time of thing that the we take a Buddhist pen to recover from. Yes. I got yes. struck by that ah, right. thing. Right. Three days near family. Yes. Other mm. one. People yes. have neighbors have to be. Yes, yes. And then the seventh thing, everyone comes, anyone can go and listen to the banner. Yes. And then they leave aside. And then you have to let go, but they go on having every yearly done it. Yes. But I was struck by that. And she had done 1,000 or quite a large right. sample. Right. Right. And then, That's of course, right. there was a gender difference in the resilience. Right. They couldn't right. touch. Right. Is there a gender difference in resilience? I think. Uh, I think they no. 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 Women are usually less in self compassion. Women are lesser, but I don't think for resilience we have that data. Right. Yeah. yeah, but self-compassion, yes. which could lead to resilience, women are lesser because right. of our traditional roles. Right. Since child childhood, we are expected to blame ourselves, yes. which leads to less self-compassion yeah. than men. Right. Which but, might they? And what about men crying? Like be a man and don't cry. That thing. And those are toxic Enough. masculine ideas. Ah, that's that's those are called toxic masculine. masculine. Yeah. Uh, right. So this is, this is the importance of discussing all this would be that because that this is the setting that our children are brought up in present day context, and these are the children that who would enter medical students and finally end up as doctors, and that the doctors that to whom that we would be going for treatment. So it's important that as governments, as professional organisations, as so uh, the the professional, the uh, as uh, responsible organisations that we discuss all these things and to see that whether there are places that as profession that we could contribute and in sort of in not only in academic way but in a fruitful way to change the attitudes of people. So with that uh, little remark, uh, let me conclude this very fruitful uh, symposium on psychological issues during and after COVID. And we had three eminent speakers, Dr. Vajra Dharmavadana, consultant psychiatrist teaching hospital Ratnapura. If we could show your appreciation to Dr. Vajra Dharmavadana as the uh, accepted manner. And then <laughs> Professor Wao Yun Law, a joint with us from uh, the Malaysia. Uh, Professor Law, thank you very much for joining with us. And just accept our appreciation in our accepted manner. I'm Professor Priyanjali Disaisa. Thank you very much, Priyanjali, for your contribution. Thank you for your patient attention. Thank you.